Good morning, everyone. We are so delighted that you are here, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a reading and conversation with Ada Calhoun and Kristen Miares Young. This event is being live streamed, so hello to everyone who is here with us in person and our virtual audience as well. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Please take a moment and silence your cell phone. Please remember there's no flash photography during the program. Please remember to enjoy your AWP and stay safe through our hand bump handshakes and hand washing. Um, and after the event, both Ada and Kristen's books will be for sale in the lobby and they will be signing in the lobby and would be delighted to talk with you and answer questions. If you would give them just a few moments to make it to the lobby before you come with all your questions, that would be fantastic. Today's event is sponsored by Grove Atlantic and Seattle Arts and Lectures, and I should have begun by saying that my name is Ruth Dickey, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of Seattle Arts and Lectures and serving on the board of AWP. Grove Atlantic and Seattle Arts and Lectures are thrilled to be presenting today's conversation with Ada and Kristen, and we're thrilled that you're here with us today. At times of uncertainty and fear, we all need community more than ever before, and I would argue that we need storytellers and writing more than ever before. What the best fiction and nonfiction does is help us to make sense of ourselves, of one another, and of the world, and we are so lucky to have two incredible sense makers and storytellers with us today. Kristen will actually be introducing Ada and tell you a bit more about herself, but as context for Kristen, I'll just say that she is a reporter, an essayist, the author of the brilliant new novel, Subduction, which is out through Red Hen Press officially on April 14th, a great curator and tender of the literary community, and our hero for jumping in at the last minute with two skillful feet. Please join me in welcoming Kristen Millares Young and Ada Calhoun. Thank you. Now, I may be a Cuban American who goes by three names, but I am no Carmen Maria Machado. Having moderated her Seattle Arts and Lectures talk when she came to Town Hall Seattle, I can tell you that she would have been brilliant today. So anyone who wants to see how highly I think of her memoir can go read my review in the Washington Post of In the Dream House. And as an investigative reporter, I was also impressed by the rigorous self-interrogation and meticulous research of Sarah Broom's memoir, The Yellow House, which moved me to re-examine my own family's flight into diaspora. The Yellow House reminds its readers that the UN considers it a human right for peoples displaced by natural disaster to return home. Think about what that means in the context of the ongoing black diaspora of Hurricane Katrina. I encourage you all to find and read their books. It's difficult to meet the challenges of true connection in today's world. Rhetoric, policy, and pandemics keep us apart. But we need to stay together as a community of thought or watch our country forever divided. So today, it is my true honor to be in conversation with Ada Calhoun. Ada is the kind of author that I wanted to meet immediately after reading her books. She faces issues like shame, displacement, invisibility, boundaries, and becoming seen head on so that others might find courage to face them privately. I kept texting pictures of her books to my friends. Read this and we'll talk, I told them. I didn't know that others felt this way, and I certainly appreciated how Ada charted our discontent against its socioeconomic context, finding damn good reasons why middle-aged women can't sleep. It's not in our heads, it's history. Reading Wedding Toast I'll Never Give and soon thereafter her New York Times bestseller Why We Can't Sleep in an otherwise quiet room with my husband, I would laugh out loud or suck in my breath real quick and he'd ask me, what's got you so worked up? And I'd start reading passages and he'd start nodding and all of a sudden we were having like a real conversation about our marriage, about our generational expectations, a talk that brought us closer in a way that's lasted. Isn't that what we all want as writers? So aside from why we can't sleep, called a generation-defining exploration of the new midlife crisis facing Gen X women and the unique circumstances that have brought them to this point, Calhoun's last two books were the New York City history, St. Mark's is Dead, and the memoir, Wedding Toast I'll Never Give, featured twice on the Today Show and named one of the top 10 memoirs of 2017 by W Magazine. And that would be enough for most people. But I include the following details to show how hard Ada works and why she earned the Village Voice's summation of her career as seeming to have been cobbled together from the CVs of three ambitious journalists. In addition to writing her own books, 
Calhoun has worked as an A-list ghostwriter since 2009, collaborating on 14 nonfiction books for major publishers, including several New York Times bestsellers. As a freelance journalist, she has written for Time, National Geographic Traveler, The Times Literary Supplement, The New Republic, among others, as well as contributing essays to The New Yorker Online, to the Modern Love column and Lives column of The New York Times. Her past jobs include crime reporter for The New York Post, frequent contributor to The New York Times book reviewer, editor-in-chief of the online magazine Babbel.com, and theater critic for New York Magazine. Her national news reporting has won multiple awards, including a USC Annenberg National Health Journalism Fellowship, a, Kli a Kiplinger Fellowship, a CCF Media Award for her New York Times reporting about the criminalization of bad mothers in Alabama, a Crowley Award, and an Alicia Patterson Fellowship. A teacher at various conferences and universities and an advocate for public libraries, Ada is co-founder of the Journalist Society and reading series, Sob Sisters. Now, I spent some time on the questions I'm gonna ask her but I know the truest re resource here is your attention, which Simone Weil called the purest of generosities. After Ada and I both read brief excerpts and talk for about 30 minutes, we'll seek questions from you right around one o'clock. Please welcome Ada Calhoun. Thank you. <laughs> Should I start with the reading? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so this book is about middle-aged women. How many middle-aged women are in the audience? I can't see super well. Hello, my friends. Um, <laughs> wonderful. So you will relate, and I hope others will um, relate, too, in certain ways. Um, so the book is called Why We Can't Sleep, Women's New Midlife Crisis. It came out of a story I wrote for Oprah.com. Uh, and I'm just going to read a bit of the introduction. And because that's a little bit depressing, I'm also going to read a bit of the more uplifting conclusion. One woman I know had everything she'd ever wanted a loving partner, two children, a career she cared about, even the freedom to make her own schedule, but she still couldn't shake a feeling of profound despair. She spent months getting a babysitter for her toddler daughter in the middle of the day, using the time to go alone to noon movies where she sat in the dark and cried. A former coworker told me that her impressive LinkedIn profile was misleading. In truth, she was underemployed, and for years since her last layoff, had been taking one low-paying gig after another. She's unmarried and never had kids, and while that part is okay with her, she has started dreading her upcoming 50th birthday, having realized she will probably never own her own home and has saved nowhere near enough for retirement. A neighbor with a small army of adorable young children was doing part-time work she enjoyed. Her kid's father was a friendly, hardworking man. She was baffled by the rage she had come to feel toward him. She'd begun to imagine that divorced, she might have a better shot at happiness. I'd leave, she said to me one day when I asked how things were going, if I had more money. Another woman told me she had started to fear that she would die alone. Just like her married friend, she'd gotten a good education and had a good job, had made a nice home and was staying in shape, but somehow she had never found a partner or had children. She woke up in the middle of the night wondering if she should have married her college boyfriend, if she should freeze her eggs, if she should have a baby alone, if she should do more or less online dating and just how much more she could take of her friend's sons and daughters smiling on social media before she threw her laptop out the window. An acquaintance told me she'd been having a hard time working three jobs as a single mother since her husband left her. Determined to cheer up her family, she planned a weekend trip. After a long week, she started packing at 10 p.m., figuring she could catch a few hours of sleep before their 5 a.m. departure. She asked her 11-year-old son to start gathering his stuff. He didn't move. She asked again, nothing. If you don't help, she told him, I'm going to smash your iPad. He still didn't move. As if possessed, she grabbed a hammer and whacked the iPad to pieces. <laughs> when she told me this, I thought of how many parents I know who have fantasized or threatened this very thing, and he or she had actually done it. I laughed. Yeah, my friends think it's a hilarious story too, she said, but in reality, it was dark and awful. Her first thought as she stood over the broken glass, I have to find a good therapist right now. Since turning 40 a couple of years ago, I've been obsessed with women my age and there are struggles with money, relationships, work, and existential despair. Looking for more women to talk to for this book, I called my friend Tara, a successful reporter a few years older than me who grew up in Kansas City. Divorced about a decade ago, she has three mostly grown children and lives on a quiet leafy street in Washington, D.C. with her boyfriend. They recently adopted a rescue dog. Hey, I said, happy to have caught her on a rare break from her demanding job. 
do you know anyone having a midlife crisis I could talk to? The phone was silent. Finally, she said, I'm trying to think of any woman I know who's not. And now I'll read something from the slightly more uplifting conclusion. Um, maybe the Generation X story need not be we're broke, we're unstable, we're alone. Maybe it can be we've had a hard road to hoe, we've been one big experiment, and yet look at us, we've accomplished so much. Generation X women who as children lacked cell phones and helicopter parents came up relying on our own wits. To keep ourselves safe, we took control. We worked hard and made lists and tried to do everything all at once for a very long time and without much help. We took responsibility for ourselves and later, we also took responsibility for our work or partners or children or parents. We should be proud of ourselves. I keep thinking about the 1980s to 90s TV show Double Dare in which child contestants had to find orange flags among obstacles such as mountains of slime. That, I think, is an excellent analogy for our generation in midlife. We've been glopped with slime. But somewhere in the mess, there is that little orange flag. One of my favorite studies is about how children benefit from hearing an oscillating family narrative. The researchers found that what helps you build resilience in children is a story like this. Dear, let me tell you, We've had ups and downs in our family. We built a family business. Your grandfather was a pillar of the community. Your mother was on the board of the hospital, but we also had setbacks. You had an uncle who was once arrested. We had a house burned down. Your father lost a job, but no matter what happened, we always stuck together as a family. That kind of tale fosters self-confidence more even than one in which the family has been on a steady upward climb. Gen X might not live on an economic upslope, but perhaps we can make meaning out of our dip in prosperity and say, we will be okay. If we don't fix it all, maybe our kids will. Post-millennials, also known as Gen Z, are likely to be the most diverse and best educated generation in American history. There will be ups and downs in the future, just as there have been in the past. Whatever comes, we know we can handle it. I felt so seen reading her work. I really, I can't tell you how much I encourage you to read it. I, I felt that, I felt the story had been submerged for so long as a way of social control, so that to keep women away from each other, so that we would not recognize uh, how these forces work, confining us, not only to lead like, you know, perfect lives, but also to feel ashamed about the ways in which we were carrying them forward. Even if we were trying so hard, we could barely sleep. So I'm just really excited about today's conversation. I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel, Subduction. Uh, there are copies outside, but it's not coming out until April. Um, and Subduction really does follow a woman who's um, in the middle of a, a crisis. Uh, it's a lyric retelling of the troubled history of encounter in the Americas. And a Latina anthropologist makes her way out to Nia Bay, which is a Macaw whaling village on the northwest tip of the lower 48. She's carrying a lot of damage. Her husband just left her for her sister. And in that midlife freefall, she makes some mistakes. Daylight pressed against her eyelids. A bright smear beamed between glued lashes. Her head was beyond aching. It pulsed. The hangover occupied her entire body, spilling off the bed and pooling onto the floor, filling the room. She tipped her face to the window. Curtains parted onto a view of cloudless blue. Her eyes were sticky. So was her mouth. She closed her eyes again. The glare tackled her lids. From beneath, she saw a different planet, a red world veined with mauve. Birds chirped. A car started. Tires scraped over asphalt. Children shouted in Spanish. A woman shushed them. A car door slammed. She squeezed her eyes shut, scrunching her face. Pain radiated from her temples. Claudia spread her hands on the bed, patting rough folds of cotton. She was naked and alone, but for two crumpled pillows. She reached between her lips. There, where her legs met, was a swamp. Her period? She swiped and came up with the silky black hair too long to belong to her. Groaning, she turned her back to the window. She was alone now, but she hadn't been. Peter. She tucked both hands between her thighs. She just had unprotected sex with the son of her best hope for a meaningful qualitative study. Everyone would find out if he felt like making it known. And what man wouldn't? She swung her legs off the bed and sat up. Her headache expanded like a dying star. 
A stripe of dirt and flies lined the gray carpet where it tucked into the plastic baseboard. The sound of her own breath echoed in her ears. The children outside screamed and laughed. A vacuum bumped around the room next to hers. Sometimes macaws worked these jobs. Even if they lived off the reservation, they'd talk. She'd have to erase the evidence. She turned her head toward the door. It was not chained. She always chained the door. That meant they'd had sex here, or at least come back here. She fought an image of his face moving above her, careening in and out of focus. Her clothes were doubled over on a chair. That's not how she would arrange them. He tidied up. Craning her neck, she checked the other nightstand. Her keys were stacked next to a full glass of water. Had she driven herself here? If not, she would be seen walking an exposed and dangerous stretch of highway that had no other purpose this morning but to shame her. If so, she should already be ashamed. And she was. She had violated every code of ethics she ever agreed to hold sacred, and she did it on a whim, wasting herself. It couldn't be undone. She drained the glass. Water ran down both sides of her mouth. She would have to make herself presentable. Driving down Front Street was like strolling a promenade. Everyone checked you out. If there was a halfway decent chance they knew you, drivers waved or weaved their cars to show that you'd been seen. Claudia stood up to tug the paisley curtains together, wondering if Peter left them parted on purpose. They stuck right where they were, loosing a light flurry of dust as the acrylic shimmied back into place. OK, no, he hadn't. She scurried to the bathroom, hiding her ass and avoiding the mirror, and checked the wastebasket. No condom, no shiny wrapper, not even a tiny torn off corner. Maybe he flushed them. No, that wasn't it, and she knew that already. She faced her reflection. Her shoulders and breasts bore rough red patches and pirouetted to check her back. On her neck, next to her spine, four bruises bloomed in a row, purple as pansies. Seeing them alarmed her. A shower. First things first. The motel stocked the kind of soap that splits in two when you open the wrapper and nothing else. It would have to do. Her fingers smelled like common cigarettes. She didn't dare take a whiff of her hair. Claudia peed herself to keep warm, focusing on the shower, which was almost hot. Everything would be OK. Things would get better the cleaner and emptier she got. She scoured her scalp with shards of soap, moving down her body in brusque circles. The water was cooling. By the time she got to her thighs, it was frigid. She let the icy stream blast her face. Swollen eyes rode herd on a long night of hard drinking. With no conditioner, there wasn't much she could do about her hair. The towels were the size of tissues at about the same thickness. She tried her air with unwise flips of her head, reeling against the sink as her brain sloshed back into place. Scrubbing her teeth with a wet towel corner, she rinsed and spat and searched for flashbacks to begin to reconstruct her night. Kelly Green, yes. It began by playing pool his bad break. No, no, it began with beers on the beach and the slow creek to Clallam Bay. Amber light in a tumbler and another and another and another. Had she ordered those drinks or did he bring them to her unasked? She couldn't remember paying for anything but the first round, which she did with cash in case she got stopped. She saw herself sink the eight ball, watched his face sharpen, his smile lines crystalline as he held the door on their way out. Stars tumbling on their right. Oh, the passenger seat. Good, she hadn't driven. Warmth on her body, a hand on her throat, her head against the wall. The motel clerk's call. Fuck. They were already famous. Thank you. <laughs> so Ada, you described how a sense of like socially enforced privacy and collective shame had encouraged the loneliness that you felt at midlife, an isolation that you combated by interviewing other women. And they were only too glad to be asked, so why are we taught to keep quiet? And how can we, as women and writers, reclaim that territory? Um, so when I got this assignment from Oprah.com, I started calling women all over the country and asking them for recommendations and reaching out through social media channels um, of the magazine. And, um, and I was so surprised that almost every woman I talked to would begin with some variation of, I have no right to complain. Um, I'm very lucky, she would say. And, um, and then she would start talking about her life and how much fear and anxiety there was involved in it. Um, and I began to think that, that the shame around feeling less than ecstatic and mindful um, was contributing a lot to, to how hard these women's lives were. Yeah. Mindful is the new, be quiet. 
I mean, I started to kind of think that. And I feel like, I, I mean, I believe in gratitude and all of these other things we're told to practice. Um, and yet I started to see this dark side to them, that, that they do somehow involve not complaining and just sucking it up day after day. Mm -hmm. And the women that I interviewed, many of them were working full-time jobs, taking care of aging parents, taking care of young children, um, while going through perimenopause. And they were doing all of these things um, quietly and, and just getting through it. Uh, and I, I think once they started talking, they were very glad to talk. You mentioned perimenopause, and uh, reading your book, I mean, I, my friend has described it to me as the rage, and, uh, and I had perhaps experienced it as anxiety, um, but what, what should we know about perimenopause for those women in the audience who, like me, um, perhaps have remained a, a bit too ignorant of something that's affecting us? Well, I was blindsided by it. I had never even heard the term, actually, until right around when I started working on this story um, when I was 41. Uh, and what I was shocked by is it affects just about everything, and it affects about 80% of women quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, so it can be uh, brain fog and uh, hot flashes, mood swings, weight gain, I mean, just one thing after the other. And I think women tend to think, oh, I'm just not going to the gym enough, or I'm, you know, there's something wrong with me and how I'm doing things, rather than this is a stage of life that can be quite physically and emotionally difficult. Yeah, they prepare us, I think, some ways. I mean, women kind of hide the ball a little bit when you're going into pregnancies and then, you know, uh, <laughs> postpartum because they're like, don't scare her off, you know. But it's amazing to me how much collective wisdom there is around this subject matter, and yet it's not been daylighted. And that's what I think the great project of your book, uh, to steward us into accepting and understanding uh, and then being able to treat uh, this condition. So one of the things that I was really fascinated by was how um, scientific suppression of the stories of women had uh, about our bodies had uh, foreclosed what may be the most effective treatment. Um, could you talk a little bit about daylighting that science as you did your research? Yeah, so I was really surprised that, um, that this generation of women doesn't really know anything about, say, hormone replacement mm -hmm. therapy or various other therapies around um, hormones because of something that happened in 2002, which was that there was a study that was stopped early and, um, and then very badly publicized. So the, there was uh, an embargo that was violated. It's complicated. Um, it's all in the book. But, um, but as a result, doctors just stopped studying it, many, many doctors, and they stopped teaching it in many medical schools. And um, it just became a very unfashionable line of inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that now only something like one in five gynecologists actually studies menopause medicine. Um, and that's, forget about general practitioners. That's, that's, and obstetrics and gynecology is a much sexier, much higher paying field than menopause. And that's, that's part of it too. And as a result, I mean, women are getting prescribed antidepressants when what they need is treatment for perimenopause. So this, 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 this silencing of this study and the kind of ways in which women could seek relief is leading to a lot of uh, bad prescriptions. Well, and one in four women this age are on, are on antidepressants now um, with varying, varying success rates. So, you know... You write about this anxiety and self-critique of the generation of women who feel that we must do everything with distinction. And as an alternative to this pervasive feeling of not enoughness, which leads to shame, you proposed, and this shocked me, a radical acceptance of the self and the life in front of you to the point where the answer is to lower expectations, which made me give the emoji eyes. I'm like, what? Um, so could you talk about this idea, which is so radical in our culture? Well, so women who are in their 40s and 50s now grew up in the 70s and 80s being told with good intentions, um, you can be anything, even president. Um, a lot of the women that I interviewed um, told me stories, like one said that, that her mother had said, no, 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 you don't want to be a nurse when she said that's what she wanted to be when she grew up. You want to be a doctor. You want to be a surgeon. You want to really reach for the stars. And I think as a generation, we were told that again and again. Um, and in some ways, that was a very good thing to hear. But it was not coupled with support. So 40% of us were children of divorce. Uh, it was an economically and uh, culturally very fraught time in this country. And as a result, a lot of the people who were supposed to be doctors 
couldn't even maybe get through college without taking out huge loans or dropping out to work. Um, and so I, I think it's worth looking at the context. So a lot of the women that I interviewed, they said, you know, what's wrong with me? Why didn't I reach the stars like I was told I would? And the book is an attempt to say, well, it's not just because you didn't work hard enough. There was a context for it. I was literally told that you could be president. I have often wondered what was wrong with me that I didn't become <laughs> president. Um, perhaps we can one day interview another woman who has worked so hard to daylight the stories of our community and find out the lessons that she learned uh, in her campaign to do so. So, you know, you write about generativity, which you defined as caring beyond, about others beyond yourself and your family. And then, this is interesting, redemption sequences. Uh, in which negative experiences become meaningful through retellings. And this gives me great hope for 2020. Um, so it seems to me that these are like necessary elements of memoir, and I've certainly found it true of personal essays. But did writing these books help you craft a redemption sequence and for the difficult eras of your life? Um, it helped me a lot see what was going on in the world that maybe affected me in ways that I wasn't aware of, and that was extremely helpful. Hearing other women's stories was very helpful. Um, it made me feel much less alone when I was working on the book. I really feel like it did cure my midlife crisis, mm -hmm. having that community um, with other women. But to your point about generativity, I think it's so interesting in a memoir how you can, you can do so, so much with a memoir. You can identify who the heroes and the villains are in your own personal story, and what were the turning points, and where does the story start, and where does it end? And I think seeing um, your life as scenes in that way, mm -hmm. writing them out, um, it, it can let, help you let go of a lot of, I don't know, like self-judgment mm -hmm. um, and confusion. Yeah. Um, so how did you stay married in the process of revealing, I'm asking for a friend here, um, <laughs> of such intimate, <laughs> difficult truths in Wedding Toast I'll Never Give? It was a book that at first when I was reading it, I was reading it privately, and I was tucking it into my bag because I didn't want my husband to start talking about it with me. And then, and then I thought, no, I, we do need to have these talks. And so then I brought it out, and I started leaving it around, and then reading passages it allowed. So it kind of, I kind of hid it for a little while, and then I like brought it out slowly. And then I was like, <laughs> okay, now you must read this. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, it's, uh, some younger writer asked me the other day. She's like, or said, I think it's so wonderful. You don't care what anybody thinks, including your husband. Um, which is sort of a backhanded compliment, but I, uh, he, I do care what he thinks, and he's, he's rather odd in a lot of ways, um, and he really enjoys any time I write anything remotely kind of wild or weird or um, scintillating. So he's unusual in that way, and I, I feel sorry for all the memoirists out there who are not married to people um, who, who have that proclivity. Um, I think that being honest about these things is, is almost always helpful because, mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think it helps me just get it out and make sense of it mm -hmm. on the page. And then hearing from so many other people, as I did after some of the essays in that book ran in Modern Love. I had like three in the Modern Love column, and after every one, I would just get this flood of messages saying thank you. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, why else, why else write if you don't make some kind of impact on people's in our lives. Did you hear her say three modern love columns? What? Three, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so excited about that. I, um, and, and the book is so, it's such, a, it, it reads quickly, but it's so, because it's, it's written this very like economic way, but it's very lyric, and she brings in so much wisdom and reference and citation that um, I highly, just highly encourage you to, to read it. Um, so you wrote about midlife invisibility, which is often felt to be a scourge for women like us who want to take up space professionally, intellectually. But this midlife invisibility being a source of power. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that notion that invisibility provides freedom. Well, so uh, I'm friends with a lot of women in their 50s, 60s, 70s who, um, who seem so mild-mannered and so, um, so innocent, and then they are some of the best investigative reporters in, in history, from what I can tell. Um, and a lot of it is because they're underestimated. Mm -hmm. And I think being underestimated allows you to surprise the world. And, and I think, sadly, women over 40 get underestimated all the time, but maybe it is an, an opportunity. There's that Dolly Parton line where people say, oh, you know, does it, does it bother you, all the dumb blonde jokes? 
And she said, no, not at all, because I know I'm not dumb and I know I'm not blonde. <laughs> um, the poet Sharon Old said something once where she said that once she stopped worrying about being considered beauty, beautiful, that she could then stop to consider the beauty of the world. Mm. And that she realized that she'd been living in a prism of paranoia of the gaze of others uh, without giving herself the freedom to really encounter the world as uh, an open being, unconcerned with being evaluated based on her appearance. Mm -hmm. um, so you wrote that the, the joys of midlife um, include connecting with other women. How have you done that? You gave some pretty good recommendations that I was hoping you might share. Um, I started a, a club for women journalists called Sob Sisters because, and do people know that term? It was what uh, women reporters were called back in the 10s and 20s as a dismissive derogatory um, phrase. So they, they got all the sob stories, right? Um, but we just meet at a bar once a month and we have people read and we have editors come in and we talk shop and it's been transformational. And we've been doing it for two years and people have gotten book deals and found fact checkers and gotten assignments. And so there's that, but then also just, we have this, uh, this network. So if we're really frustrated because our book's not selling well or because you know we can't get this editor to write us back. Everyone in the room knows what that's like mm -hmm. and, and there's a solidarity to it. So I recommend everyone start any, any relevant club at all. I, I think it can, it can change your life. I mean, it's very practical. She's like, you choose like two hours on a regular day of the month. Don't make it too often, you know, and just make it recurrent so that you don't have to plan. You know, you're not promoting it necessarily. You're just gonna be there and that comfort of knowing that it's happening yeah. takes people out of the event idea and puts them into like, let's get, get together and hang out. And no one comes to everyone, you know, yeah. but, I, but if you get to six out of 12, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so you highlight the cost of defining yourself, whether within the beautiful constraints of a marriage or as Gen X. And I was wondering like how embracing those paradigms has uh, affected your life. Um, well, you know, so the first book that I had come out uh, with Norton, that was about five years ago, was about um, the history of St. Mark's Place. Do people know? I know there's one former neighbor of mine that's in the audience. Um, it's a kind of a wild street in New York City's East Village, and I did a 400-year history of the street. And as I was doing that, I, I kept hearing from people like, oh, it's dead, it's, it's over. I don't know if San Antonio has this... Um, issue, but in New York, everyone's always saying it used to be so much better. You should have, should have seen it in the old days. Um, and when I was doing that, I, I found people who were saying that even a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. uh, just saying like, oh, it was much better in like the 1870s. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was doing that, I, I realized this connection with all these people from who were dead, like long dead. And I found that so freeing. And just to think like, whatever I write, it it doesn't really matter right now. It's mm -hmm. it's for the future and those people who maybe will find it later on. Um, so I think there's something very liberating about about that and lets you write things about your husband and wanting to kill him um, because you're briefly, <laughs> briefly. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't. So yeah. you know, in our modern life, the pace is so hectic. But you write about what the poet Jack Gilbert called paying attention to being alive. So given the pace of uh, production and engagement that you sustain um, as part of your literary life, how do you, how do you attend to that precept? Um, I think it's all we have. I mean, I think that, um, that empathy is the only thing that I know of that really lets me get out of my own head. Uh, it's so easy to get stuck and, and to be obsessive about your own issues, but <laughs> hearing yeah. other women's stories in for this book and hearing other people's stories for the other books I've done and articles I've done um, and the reporting that I've done in other parts of the country. Um, if you're really doing it, if you're really listening to people, um, they tell you amazing things, first of all, and that makes your life interesting um, to hear those stories. But then also I just think it, it lets you really get actual perspective. And that for me, that's life-saving. So you wrote that uh, there is a notion of of power available in speaking truth. And so I wonder, you know, aside from your chance encounters of the 2170, when people might um, pick up your history of, of St. Mark's and realize that, no, it, it wasn't, it's not better than it was 30 years ago. Um, what has publishing these books done for your life? 
Uh, it's let me meet a lot of people who I'm like you, <laughs> who um, who have made my life so much richer. I just I think I'm I'm now able to like go go kind of anywhere and be around other writers and um, and if I if I call people to, to interview them, a lot of times they will call me back now. And that is valuable. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, they say that you know comparison is a thief of joy. So I'm not going to try to measure my rate of production over the past five years since the publication of St. Mark's with yours and the like, dozen books you've ghostwritten, all of those investigations, like these three books. But I do want you to tell me your secret. So what are your writing rituals? <laughs> tell us. Um, I, I've started to think I should get some. I don't have any. I don't know if that's going to um, be reassuring or not reassuring. Um, I, I go to the library often, and I, and I wear headphones, and I write for as long as I can. And when I was doing the first couple books, it was between like drop off and pick up for mm -hmm. my son. Um, but I think what's the major motivating force is like terror about money. Mm -hmm. So like I've always been baffled by people who miss deadlines or who um, who you know pu push things back really far because I'm like no if you don't turn it in you don't get paid. Mm -hmm. So the, the the fear the fear of of being broke has um, has made me work <laughs> a lot <laughs> over the last few years. And that's part of the anxiety that she writes about in why we can't sleep many people being driven into a constant state of production which, or engagement, which may not be as rewarding as writing, but for uh, financial reasons, as our student loans and um, other debts come calling. Um, and and I, um, I will say I, I try to be very organized, so I have a lot of folders on my computer, and, um, and then I sort like audio files and transcripts and research and that kind of thing, and that helps a lot. But also I think the more I do, the more I can do. There's that phrase, if you want something done, ask a busy person. Mm -hmm. And I, because if I'm working on a ghostwriting project I and I get annoyed or bored of that project, then I feel like I'm able to kind of cheat on that project with my own book, and it's um, and then it's more fun. Mm -hmm. I'm more grateful for that time writing my own work, and then if I get frustrated having to do my own work and you know dig deep and all that, then I can bask in the glory of someone else's ideas, and it makes makes life easier to go back and forth as as you as you lose faith and um, and get get bored. I've been given really good advice with two things, which was uh, be known as a closer. Uh, and always have multiple projects going um, yeah. and for this reason, that when you reach an emotional block or um, there is some kind of delay in getting records or something like that, that you are not being, your pace is not slowed by the world and your yes. internal landscape. I agree with that. So how do you balance that uh, research process with writing? Are you writing while you're researching? Or how do you, fr and how, how do you like um, condition your research questions so that they keep you focused rather than becoming a deferral? I, I mean, I usually do everything all at, all at once. Mm -hmm. I don't ever, I'm, and, and it's like, if I'm cooking, I do everything out of order. You know, I, it's mm -hmm. like, um, it's just whatever shiny thing is attracting my attention right that minute. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have any technique. Folders. <laughs> I have folders. Yeah, folders. Yeah. Um, I would like to be um, open right now and say that while I could ask her questions for, for longer, I would like to open it up to the audience. And if you have questions, um, I will repeat them into the mic uh, so that those who are live streaming uh, can also hear them. So do we have any questions you'd like to ask? Don't be shy. Silencing has been happening for millennia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I want to repeat the question really quick. Uh, there, the, a woman from the audience said, many of us uh, endured and survived perimenopause pause by drawing upon a, a close circle of friends. And does Ada think that that is something that is missing from our generation? Yes. So, um, so one thing about this generation is we have extremely low rates of uh, attendance at like churches and synagogues and that kind of thing. Um, we have very few community groups that we belong to. Um, and there isn't a, a pattern of, like, your, your day involves seeing other women. 
uh, a lot of women that I interviewed said they were way too busy. So I also I talked to about 200 women for the book. Um, they almost all said that they had no time for friendship. They, had, they were lonely. And, and it was because they were working full time while doing a lot of caregiving. And, uh, and I agree with you that, that it's something that you have to you have to find a way to get. I, I certainly did. It's made my life much, much better since I started surrounding myself with other women in the same boat. And she also wrote that, that um, many people now don't have hobbies, really. They have side hustles, which is different. Very different, uh, the exploration versus the capitalizing upon and turning something into another creative unit of, of production. And of course, sharing hobbies with another person is um, a way of developing friendship. And, your, the idea of being too busy to make friends uh, resonates. I just actually had a drink with a, a friend I hadn't seen in a long time who's a, a lawyer, and she told me she just had to fill out her daughter's preschool application, um, and they had a space for hobbies, and she was like going, oh, like finger painting, blah, 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 and then no, she found out that it was for her, like she, they wanted to know what her hobbies were, and she just stared at it for like <laughs> minutes um, because she was like, I don't, I don't ha I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, and I have mm -hmm. two small children. I don't have... What is this hobby you speak of? Just like cleaning my home? <laughs> you know, <laughs> is that? <laughs> Staring into space? Yeah. Yeah. Worrying about the future? <laughs> Waking uh, up at 3 a.m.? One of the best ways I've found to actually keep up my reading practice is to divert uh, my insomnia into novels. Oh. <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, it's so, it's so funny you say that too because I've started to suspect that there's some reason we're all waking up between two and four in the morning. Like, are we supposed to go somewhere, meet up, <laughs> do something? There's that Grimm's fairy tale, 12 Dancing Princesses. Do people know that? One, I had it when I was a kid and I read it to my son and, um, and in it all the princesses disappear in the middle of the night. They, like, no one knows where they go and it turns out they've been sneaking out of the castle to go and dance in this magical underground palace. So maybe that's oh, wow. what we're supposed to be doing. Well, you know, that's really ancient wisdom too. I was recently reading this study about uh, the Grimm's and other fairy tales, and rather than trying to find the source of the tale itself, they did an etymological um, map. And what they found is using the root versions of the words that these were stories that went back 5,000 years, oh. um, so much farther than they had imagined. Um, so maybe those women are trying to tell us something. <laughs> maybe. Or maybe we're trying to get more activity out of the dark hours. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what we need. <laughs> Other questions? Hello. So uh, to summarize the question, she invokes a collective disappointment that warns Candace, someone who was so competent, was not elevated to, uh, to actually fight for the job that she wanted, um, and asked about gendered uh, inequalities in the household, and that being recognized as emotional labor, and asked Ada if in her research uh, she found that women were recognizing uh, the inequity and addressing it. So what I found in these interviews was that the women blamed themselves for not getting more done. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of, of shame around not having like gotten the corner office if they were in the corporate world or not having had the family they wanted if that was a goal that they had um, and not doing everything all at once. And what I hope the, the book points out is that like when women marched into the workplace men didn't like march back into the home at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, women just are doing more. So it's not like they, are, they switched one role for another. They're just doing all the roles and being very judgmental of themselves often um, in each and every category. Um, Gen X men do a lot more than boomers did. So 
a lot of Gen X men will congratulate themselves for changing diapers. Like my father never even spent any time with us when we were babies. Um, and that's wonderful, except that the fact is they're not doing half the work. They're doing maybe 20 or 30 percent of the work if you look at some of the studies. Um, and yet they need, or they're, they're given um, a lot of congratulations for doing it. Like the, the man with the baby Bjorn on the Saturday morning is like just lauded with praise, right? And, um, and, and it is great that they're doing so much more, but the cost is that the women who they're with and in heterosexual relationships, they are, um, they're doing much, much, much more and not getting that kind of adulation for it. Not even from themselves. That's the hard part, is taking on more and more and more and just ratcheting up and ratcheting up and not taking a moment to recognize how much we've added yeah. and are asking of ourselves. Well, and so many of the experts, the therapists that I spoke with for the book said that the women that they see now, um, women in middle age, are so tired and, um, and that they, just, they see what's not there. They're, all, they're always focused on what's not there. Um, and one, this one generational expert who does a lot of research in social science, she told me that it used to be women would maybe judge themselves on one or two fronts. Maybe it was appearance, maybe it was their job, maybe it was their family, it was something. But that women today tend to have 20 different categories that they're looking at. And it, you know, everything from uh, you know, appearance to work to the children's after school activities um, to how well they recycle and how, you know, like how ego conscious they are. Um, and that, that nobody's ever going to hit 10 out of 10 in every one of those categories every day. And so you're always catching up and catching up. And I think that's why there's just been this boom in self help and self care also, which in a way I've started to find kind of depressing. Like maybe it's like self care because no one else is taking care of you? You mentioned that wellness as an imposition, that not only out of, uh, that we're not allowed to be stressed and like drinking too much coffee and maybe having a cigarette every once in a while if we wanted to, that now we're like making protein smoothies and doing crunches you know, on our lunch break uh, as a form of self-care, uh, which, I'm, you know, great, wonderful, I'm, you know, you know call me, uh, but, um, <laughs> but I realized, you know, there's this Latino thing, um, not everyone does it, but uh, for New Year's, you, you make 12 resolutions and you eat grapes. Like the last 12 second countdown, you're putting a grape in for every single second. So it's kind of a mess. Um, <laughs> but I realized that you have to write out your resolutions ahead of time. And so I was writing out these resolutions and then my resolutions sprouted subcategories. Um, and it was bullet pointed and I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, so this year for the very first time, I had a radical reformation of, uh, of my resolutions and I said that I was going to operate out of an abundance mentality. Um, and you know, wiped out the subcategories, all of the, um, but even so, I think many of us continue to feel that not only must we evaluate ourselves according to all of those categories, but now we're also performing those categories online mm -hmm. for our community through social media. And that in itself is an, an additional uh, engagement that can erode the inner landscape. Um, and that's done so much damage. I mean, I, I've, yeah. so many of the women that I interviewed would say things to me like, you know, how does everybody, how's everybody else doing it? How do they all have it figured out? And I think they got that idea as I feel like I probably have internalized. Also, that because you're only seeing these filtered versions of everything all day long, it's like this brainwashing campaign mm -hmm. that convinces you that everyone else like looks better than they really do and mm -hmm. feels better. And it's like, it's like the Christmas letter mentality, like where no one ever is honest in the Christmas letter, right? No one's ever like, we're disappointed in how the children are doing in school and we don't have sex anymore, and what, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, it's always everybody's like achieving, achieving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my friend sent a, she sent a postcard, a Christmas postcard, and it was hilarious because it was her, and she did this thing where she had the tree, the tree was half trimmed, her baby was like to the side, and her husband was holding the toddler and he had a beer in his hand, just like, <laughs> it was, I was like, it was, I put it up like front and center, like this is it, people. Um, question? Oh, yes, hello.
just to repeat the question, we have a mother of a 14-month-old, congratulations, um, who straddles the millennial and generation X divide, which happens 80, 81, depending on you know, uh, your categorization. And she's asking Ada whether it's possible um, to, know, to know how the children of women in midlife crises are faring and to what extent those women can be honest with their kids and how those crises of anxiety and worry are affecting the next generation, uh, Generation Z. So, um, so we were raised, Gen X was raised um, with a very, to put it mildly, hands-off approach to parenting. Uh, many of us were latchkey kids. We were left to fend for ourselves. We often started working very young um, and, and having to do just kind of everything alone. And so there's been this big cultural swing backward um, or the other way where we are very hands-on as a generation with our kids. One of my um, best friends summed this up as uh, I had scraps of fabric, fabric for Barbie doll clothes and my children go to French immersion school. <laughs> so very common, right? You like work extremely hard to like try to give your kids more than you had and in this case it's attention. Um, women who are, were stay at home mothers in the 70s spent less children, less time with their children than working mothers do now, like quality time. Um, how? Good question. How? <laughs> <laughs> um, because they don't sleep or, mm -hmm. you know, they, they sacrifice other things. So there is evidence uh, from parenting experts that one result of this is that we were extremely, we are extremely resilient as a generation. Like, we didn't have a lot of help, we didn't have a lot of support, and we had to learn everything really young and parent ourselves in a lot of ways. And as a result, we are rather tough and feisty, and that that is not necessarily the case for millennial, younger millennial Gen Z. Kids, they're more dependent, they're more involved with their parents. They're, they seem to be more anxious. Um, and although a lot of that might also be due, as some studies have shown, to uh, technology. So constant exposure from a very young age to technology combined with not really having to do a lot for themselves has made them maybe a little, not nervous, but like, um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of stressed by difficulty in this way. I, I feel that. I mean, I have AT&T service, which isn't very good. And <laughs> when I go into the rural parts of Washington State or even, you know, patches of, of, of cities um, and I don't get service, I realize that actually that, in, that enabled interconnectivity has been uh, fomenting anxiety that was unnecessary. There's no need to be checking and flickering through all these social medias or uh, news accounts all the time. And they're saying that young women especially are bearing the brunt of social media and its effect on the psyche due to the belittlement of their intellectual capacity and the analysis of their physical availability and appearance. Um, it's a problem. But I will say that the uh, anecdotally, the young mothers I know, like around your age, um, seem to have this happy medium between the boomer um, hands-offness and the Gen X hands-on. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of room there to find this place in between where you're not like making your own baby food um, and kind of obsessing, um, but you're also emotionally available. Yeah, I, I have a four and a five-year-old at home. They're about 18 months apart. And what I've found is that putting the phone away for large swaths of the day does wonders for our engagement. Um, when we engage with the phone uh, as, as parents, we are often doing something. We are scheduling an appointment for them. We are you know, arranging uh, you know, grocery items to be delivered to our home. We're doing things that are for them, but what they perceive uh, is the lack of attention. But then other times, we're also trying to convince ourselves that we still have a life, and we're having a public life, and we're in the public forum with our ideas, and we're maybe promoting our books on social media, whatever we do with our phones. Um, but that break of attention and then diversion back toward the child can make us feel like we're not doing anything well enough. And so just taking the phone out of the equation for um, as long as one can stomach it, uh, I found has been very beneficial. Although everybody has to go look, go on your phone at some point and look um, up your video of opening your oh. box. Of, there's a, there's a, a video of Kristen opening um, the first box of her book, which is wonderful and everyone should buy, called Subduction. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs>
and then the, her son is like in the other room being like, what, what is it, what is it? And she's like, it's mama's book. Like, and it's, but it's like so heartbreaking, it made me cry watching it, so. Highly recommend her Twitter feed. I actually, I rewatched it a couple of times. It's a kind of a long road, and it's a hard one, and to take a moment to be grateful for those moments, um, like it's, this, thank you for, for name checking beautiful. my book. <laughs> Um, we probably have time for uh, a few more questions. So oh, I can see one right there, yeah. To retake the question, although we now we're going to have a, a mic traveling around, uh, looking into the future of, of trying to have it all as a mother and as a writer and as a literary community member, um, it seems that this dream of having it all is a false one. So she's asking, uh, what of Ada? What are the elements that might go first, or is it possible? And and what sacrifices of pieces of the dream are needed in order to have any part of it? Um, so I think there's this illusion, this having it all illusion, that there is like that you're gonna you're gonna get each of the things. Like you'll have a best-selling book and the child who's you know relatively happy and the home that's clean or whatever, and you'll have all the things, and then you'll feel this sense of peace because you have all the things. Um, and that is not, in my experience, true. Like I think that everyone needs to figure out what in that exact moment is the most fulfilling thing and to maybe let, like, let yourself off the hook for not doing everything all at once. Um, there's that Michelle Obama <laughs> talk that she gave where somebody asked her about like lean in and she was like, that shit doesn't work all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the truth. Like it's, and, and she said like, it is a lie. You can't, you can't have everything all at once. And I think it's just, it's just a question of like, what is, what is having it all for you? Like, what does that actually look like? Um, I think it's really different for everybody. And, and I think what it seems to be is it's a moving goalpost for a lot of women. Like, a lot of the women I interviewed uh, would say, like, oh, you know, I thought I was going to have a family and a career, and I only have one of those things. Um, but then women I interviewed who had both a career and a family, both of which were thriving, said, oh, I thought I was going to be at the top of my field. I thought I was going to have three children, not two. Like there, there was just this, this constant yearning for more. And I feel like that's, that's where a lot of the anxiety in the women that I talk to came from. So, I mean, I, I mean, I have all the things now, right? Like my book's been on the bestseller list for three weeks and I, my, you know, knock on wood, my kids seem okay. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not constantly hoping for other things and more things. In my former life as a reporter, a corporate retail reporter, I used to cover uh, Starbucks, and I was interviewing one of their uh, prior CEOs and asking him about balance. And he said that he felt that the balance was cosmic over the uh, span of a life, so that he now, in his retirement years, was able to dedicate more time to his family, whereas the early part of his uh, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s had been the career time. And that's not what's available to women. Right? We have to do it at the same time, it seems. Um, and so, but I do still feel that it is possible to give ourselves a break, that we're not going to have it all at the same time. Right? I, I used to have the kind of um, crisis of identity. Am I a journalist if I'm not practicing journalism every day? And, or do I call myself a teacher because today I'm teaching? And can I call myself a novelist if I didn't provide pages of my novel today? Uh, and the, thing, the truth is, is that we only have one pair of hands, and so those hands are dedicated to the work that they're doing at that time and validating that work and realizing that it is part of an interwoven story of your life and that you can claim all of those things, though perhaps not simultaneously. I mean, I, I will say also that like there was a moment where after St. Mark's is Dead came out, I thought like, oh, I kind of want more children. And, um, and I, and for various reasons, I didn't have more kids. Um, and I thought about being sad about that, but then I thought, you know, like I probably wouldn't have written whatever, 14 books for other people and um, two others under my own name if I had had those extra children when I, when I wanted them. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, I don't know where the lesson is that, but I, I think also just no one gets everything, you know? No, right. not, and that goes for men, too, and people of every age. There are always going to be obstacles to getting a, probably a large portion of the things that you dream of in life, and, but maybe it's, maybe it's okay. Maybe, um, maybe there are reasons. And what seems to be most foreclosed by the simultaneity of modern life is actually enjoying it. Maybe you can have it all, but maybe you don't even like it while you're having it. That's the problem. And so for me, and talking to other people who I admire who are so accomplished, like Ada, uh, to uh, create a path of uh, being able to rest and reflect upon beautiful moments is important. To have, I will use it, the mindfulness uh, in some ways to realize that something good is happening and to, in, to stop and enjoy it. It's one of the biggest pieces of wisdom that other women writers have been offering me as I launch my book. Remember to enjoy it. Don't be too anxious that you are trying to get everything done. You know, remember to enjoy it. And that, that's something that I would, uh, wisdom that I came to me from women that I, I pass on to you as well. That enjoyment is uh, the, the most important part of that life because you, if you're making choices in a state of constant grief, you know, for what we do not have, um, often those choices are conditioned against future happiness. And so staying in the realm of, um, of happiness is important. Well, and, I, and I think also we just need to dismantle this idea that we were raised with about what, what having it all would look like or what it all is. Um, like I would say maybe a dozen women I interviewed for the book spontaneously sang that Anjali perfume song to me ad. Do, you, do people know that advertisement? It was like, I can bring home the bacon and fry it up in the pan, and never let you forget you're a man. Like, there, <laughs> it, was, um, it was really insidious. And there were a lot of things like that, I think, that we internalized growing up about how we would be able to do all these things effortlessly. We could move from one room to the next and like ace everything. And, um, and I think undoing that idea is the first step to actually realizing that that what's going to look like happiness for you is going to be really different than what's going to look like happiness for somebody else. Yeah, I'm making the patriarchy of the mind. It's your next book. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Is there one more? Yes. So she had a, a craft question uh, for Ada about what the process of putting the book together looked like. Um, I imagine uh, applying to uh, why we can't sleep or uh, wedding toast I'll never give. So ghost writing. Oh, ghost writing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so ghost writing is different every time. It's basically like freelance editing mm -hmm. often. Um, sometimes it's like doing a profile in the first person. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's been very different every every time I've done it, but um, often it involves taking my little Olympus tape recorder and interviewing the person and getting however many thousands of words I need to get for the week to make the deadline, um, and then transcribing it and shaping it and sending it to the person who then marks it up, and then it's kind of a loop like that. Um, that's, that's typical. Often you only have three months to do the book, three to six months. And so it becomes very mathematical, like, okay, I need 5,000 words every week. So you have to give me two hours or however many hours a week that, that is to get those, the numbers. That's fascinating. So it's an oral history, a first-person autobiography in some ways that you're creating with this partner. Usually. Um, sometimes they also write pages, and then you incorporate what they write and sort of weave them together, and you hope seamlessly. The, the thing is, is really about finding the person's voice and trying to make it sound like they sound. Um, I never want my name on the books that I ghostwrite because it's their book. It's like, I always think of it as like midwifery, like you're not the, you're not the mother. You're just helping bring their story out for them. And then do you get a postpartum doula as well? <laughs> <laughs> it is funny, like I do feel like I wind up living with them in my head, mm -hmm. and it, it feels almost like a, where mediums, you know, psychics talk about, like they're, they have the spirit in them um, so that I can actually write like the person, 
Um, I, I majored in Sanskrit, the, the ancient Indian language in college, and that's what I thought I was going to be was a Sanskrit translator. I did it for like five years. And uh, so I think that maybe informed this because it's like I can, I, I'm used to like reading something in a very different other uh, world and then translating into like, you know, contemporary English. So it's a, it's a little easier going from like some Hollywood star to. Maybe that's how you're able to manage it because Sanskrit, one of the things I loved about your description of it was its simultaneity, how it could mean so many different things at the exact same time and that all of those meanings were being uh, rising like a hologram from the words and, and moving forward as one and that they, uh, the mind of the reader was taking that in and it allowed for a complexity of uh, readerly response, yeah. which um, we have to perhaps work differently to receive in English. It's like puns. It's like they, it has basically instead of like just two meanings, it, it has kind of like seven all in one um, phrase. Yeah, so major in Sanskrit. That's my advice. Yeah. <laughs> well. I think we have time for one more question if, if uh, someone would like to raise their hand. No pressure. Oh, there's one. Hello. Yes. I'll try it. Hopefully this comes off the right way. In your research, did you notice that the grass was always greener on the other side? Like if you were single, they wanted to be married, if they were this. And again, I hope I say this in the right way. Was there a division? Because sometimes I think women, as much as we can collaborate and we need it so much more than we do, I find sometimes there's a threat on either side of, of women. Like, well, you have that and I've put a wall up. I don't know if I expressed that the yeah. right way. Um, but did that come across and what can we do in your opinion to bridge that together? Yeah. That we can have whatever version we are, walk in a room and accept that. I think it's a great question. Um, I did find that very often. I, I, I blame the conspiracy of the so-called mommy wars for having tried to pit women against each other, one another, um, in terms of like, oh, you know, we're all different, we're making different choices, and we have to like envy one another. And I think it's been incredibly dis destructive when the truth is that, especially women of this generation, have had so many obstacles to getting even a little bit <laughs> of the, the various choices available. Um, and there is no real defined life path for this generation. So I'm 43. I have a 13-year-old son and a 26-year-old stepson, and among like my close friends who are my age, um, many don't have children. Um, uh, some have partners but no kids, and some have kids but no partners. Um, and then some have kids in their 20s, and then others have like little babies. Like I have a friend who has uh, twins, one-year-old twins, and this is common for our generation. And I, but I do think that there has been this pitting against. Um, that's happened, that's, that's tricked us into thinking that we're not all in the same situation. And I think that we, I think we are. I think it's fear-based, right? So a, a fear of, well, I wanted that, or on either end, and then that instead of having the uh, communication and the voice and the words, it turns into you are not me, and, the, and that wall goes yeah. up. But anyway, well, thank you. I think that's right, and I do think it also has so much to do with the fact that we were told over and over again, you have so many choices. Look at all of these choices available to you. And what I heard over and over from women I talked to um, was that that somehow had morphed into this idea you have to do, because you can do anything, you have to do everything. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, there's something, there's something wrong with you. Um, I also heard very often, when you mentioned the grass is greener, like women who had families had envy for like women who, um, who were single, they're like, oh, imagine just being able to like pick a guy up at a bar. Um, and then similarly, a lot of women who had wanted to have families of their own then were saying like, oh, I just wanna, I just wanna go home and like fall asleep next to my husband. I wanna have my kids wake me up early in the morning. Like I, I hear my married friends complain about that and I want what they have. And I always thought there would be like a good Freaky Friday Gen X movie that you could get out of this. Um, you should write that screenplay. I should write that screenplay. <laughs> I'm going to go do that now. I want to thank Seattle Arts and Lectures and Grove Atlantic, and most particularly you, for engaging in this conversation with Ada Calhoun. Please, a round of applause for her. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Most prepared moderator of all time. Yeah. <laughs> Hats off to you. <laughs>